the, the scriptures uses uh, three terms interchangeably to describe elders. Uh, sometimes it calls them pastors or bishops, overseers, and of course elders. So these terms can be used interchangeably, and they are used interchangeably in the word. And I've got a couple examples for you. Uh, the first one is in Acts 20. So in Acts 20, 17, uh, Paul called together the elders of the church, and he started to exhort them and teach them, encourage them. And as you read through 17 to verse 28, as you read through that section of scripture, you'll also find that he calls them overseers and pastors. And then in Peter, there's three verses in Peter that speaks to this too. And I'll go ahead and read those for you. Uh, this is from the ESV, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So my purpose of going through this with you this morning is twofold. One, I wanted you to practically know what the elders in your church do. And then two, I wanted you to know who the elders of the church are. So let's start with what the elders do. Well, today is one example of that. Uh, I'm up here teaching. So if you guys remember back in Tim, 1 Timothy 3, when Timothy, or excuse me, when Paul went through the qualification for elders, uh, one of the qualifications was that an elder should be able to teach. And so uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm filling in for Troy. And I hope I do a good job at it. But, you know, it could have just as easily been... Um, Pastor Ed or Nathan could have got up here and taught just as well as me. And so, uh, and then the other thing that we do is, and this is Troy's quote, but he says, we help him do the heavy lifting. And so what that means is that, you know, we help him with the difficult things in the ministry. You know, often in uh, ministering a church, there's a lot of difficult decisions that have to be made. And that's what Troy uses us for. He, he's also been known to call us a sounding board, you know, that, uh, that we, he throws ideas at us and asks us to pray over things. Uh, you'll often hear Troy invite the elders up after church to pray. So we, we come up here at the end of service and pray with you. Uh, and throughout the week, we meet with various people who might be going through trials, who need uh, somebody to talk to. We oversee ministries in the church. Did you know there's approximately 34 ministries that are involved in this church? And, and those are, of course, the more formal ones. But uh, we split those amongst ourselves uh, to, uh, you know, administer the church. And us as elders, we, we always aim to have unity. You know, for like I was talking about those heavy decisions that need to be made, we always aim for unity. And, you know, if, if there's a topic that comes up that one of us is uneasy about or um, they don't feel it's right to go forward, you know, we're not afraid to tabletop that issue and and pray through it. You know, we've... When the church was in Middleton, you know, we prayed about moving to Meridian for a year, you know, and so uh, we don't take these things lightly and we, we will pray through them. Uh, and as I kind of already mentioned, we administrate the church. Now I say we, but really it's Pastor Ed and Nathan. Uh, me, me and Troy don't really have that gift of administration, so, uh, but collectively we do. Uh, I was able to witness a really interesting uh, 
example of this when we went to Canada a couple years ago. Uh, the, the pastor of the Calvary Chapel in Cal- Calgary, he was a really quiet guy. But his assistant pastor was like, he was like the mouthpiece of the church. And it was really interesting uh, to hear, you know, to talk to this guy because you felt like you were talking to the head guy. And they had such an interesting dynamic, you know. He was the, the teaching pastor, but then this other guy did it seemed like all the other stuff, you know. It, nobody could get to the, that pastor unless they went through him. So they had a really interesting uh, relationship that way. And, you know, we have a lot of freedom in scriptures of how this looks. And, and I thank God for that. Um, it could look like what that church is. Or what you commonly see is where, you know, the teaching pastor, the teaching elder is going to be more... Uh, in charge, you know, that's kind of the model that we have here as well. All right, so who are the elders? Well, I already kind of let that slip out, but Pastor Troy is one of the elders, myself, Pastor Ed, and our treasurer, Nathan Cooney, is, is the other elder. Now, if you, if you don't know who those names are, uh, you can go to our website, the the front page of the website, click on About Us, and scroll down to the bottom, and you can read our bios, see our pictures, so you get the right name to the right face. You know, it's, I, I hope I'm speaking for all the elders when I say this, but, you know, it, it I sure I am, I sure that I am, but, you know, it's our hope that you feel ministered to in this church, you know, regardless if Pastor Troy is gone or if one of us are absent. You know, we, we want uh, your experience here in this church to go f- fluid as, as though no one was ever gone. And, you know, I got an encouragement from a sister bef- uh, just a little while ago before I came up to teach, and she said, you know, it's the, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what teach through you guys. And so um, that's why it's possible. That's why the... That's why these men in the Bible are so interchangeable, or elders in the word. And, uh, you know, I'm just blessed with this church family, too. I I know we're coming off of a holiday, but, you know, I've been in some churches where the the lead pastor is out. You know, he's not going to be teaching that day, and it's known, and you go to church, and the place is a ghost town, or it's half empty, you know. And, And that's sad, because... You know, I, I don't think that we're following scripture when we do that. A couple reasons, right? We're supposed to come together as uh, believers to worship together, right? So regardless of who's teaching that day, we, we should all come to church anyway. And then, and then also, I, you know, it kind of feels like, you know, maybe they're not giving the other elders or teaching pastors in their church a chance to teach, to listen. Well, that's enough of an intro. Why don't we uh, dive into the scriptures and see what Paul instructed Timothy to say. So if you would turn to verse 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says... You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. So do you see there that there's a standard set? You know, he's talking about, uh, you know, one of the elders that not only do they rule well, that they should be given a double honor, but the one that does but especially for the one that does the teaching and preaching. And so that's the model, again, that you see here at Calvary Chapel Meridian. Um, This this is really uh, the model you'll see in all Calvary chapels, as far as I know. Um, And and I think think it's that we see that here in the text, you know, that it it shows that uh, the one who does the the bulk preaching and teaching should be... uh, kind of the head or or the leader of the group. Now, 
I want to refer back to the one of the verses that I read in Peter. I'll go ahead and read it again. That was 1 Peter 5, 3. And uh, there Peter said, Not domineering over the, those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. So in verse 17 there, when he says, Let those elders who rule well, I, I hope you guys understand what kind of rule that means. Right? We, we as elders are to set an example. You know, it, we're not here to lord it over the people or uh, you know, set rules or uh, legalism, that sort of thing. That, that's not our role. Our role is to set an example. And you know, elders are really an integral part of the church. You know, whether you look at the model of a pastor-led church or or an elder-led church. You know, uh, there's a lot of churches out there that are elder-led. And, you know, they they look at this scripture and um, other scriptures, obviously, but they, they would look at this and say, you know, because of the interchangeable nature of elders, the church should be led by elders. And, you know, you could make that case. But I think in the context of what, what we're studying here in Timothy, the model looks like a pastor-led church. And uh, I say that because uh, the letter is addressed to Timothy, right? The letter wasn't addressed to the elders of the church. So I would think if they, if they would have had a strong plurality of eldership, uh, that sort of model, that it would have been written to elders, Elders hold each other accountabil- accountable. There's a lot of accountability when there's a lot of elders in the church. Um, and I'm so blessed uh, to be in the ministry with Pastor Troy because he gets this. He really understands this. Um, we've got great balance here at Calvary Chapel Meridian. You know, I've, I've heard people come up to him and say, oh, are you, are you the lead pastor? Are you the senior pastor? And he'll say, well, I'm one of the pastors. You know, he's very humble that way, that um, he doesn't like to throw himself out there as, you know, the, the main guy type of a thing. But having strong eldership in general, we hold each other accountable. And, you know, you, you really can run the risk of going on either model. You, you can run into error quite easily um, if you're not careful. You know, if, if it's too strong of a pastor-led church, you know, you can end up with a cult of personality, if you will, or, you know, it, it's more about the guy. You know, that, then I kind of vision those are the churches when the guy's gone, the church is empty because it, it ends up being more about the person instead of the church. Or if, you've, uh, if you have a very strong elder-led church, uh, the pastor doesn't have much say. You know, they can be brought in and, and swept away and bring in another pastor, and uh, it really ties their hands in the ministry and what they can do to serve the church body. Well, Paul did not avoid the issue of pay, did he? So in verse 18, he talks about pay. And he it's interesting because he quotes two scriptures Uh, to defend this idea of paying the elders. And he starts off with an Old Testament verse, and that is uh, quoted from Deuteronomy. And the second quote is from, well, you can find it in uh, Luke 10.7, but technically it's the words of Jesus, right? So the laborer deserves his wages. Um, so I think that, you know, this model is very biblical that elders of the church should be paid. Now, you know, you could ask, well, should they be paid or can the, can an elder have a job outside of the church? And I'd say absolutely. In fact, we, we do see that with Paul, right? He, uh, Paul had a tent making business where he would help support himself in the ministry, um, but he also received money from the churches that were sending him out to plant these churches and, and build up these pastors and minister to them. Um, I have a, a personal story to share uh, what happened with me 
in the church. And uh, I, I alluded earlier that we were out in Middleton uh, for a couple of years, this church was. And when we were out there, uh, I came on to help Troy. Uh, I just had a heart to help him with whatever he needed. You know, I started doing sound and cleaning, uh, uh, ushering, uh, children's ministry, youth group. You know, I, I did it all. I wore lots of hats. It was a lot of fun. But um, at the time, I, I wasn't one of the elders. Um, I think Troy had just barely made me a pastor at that time. Uh, but the elders chose to give me a wage. And I, at the time, I had, I had a really good job, and I didn't mind working 40 hours at my secular job and, and coming to the church and working 15 hours a week. That was no big deal. I, I loved it. I enjoyed it. And so I think I got a little bit prideful, and I didn't want to accept a wage. And, and I kind of pushed back a little bit, and, and Troy said, well, this is what the elders said. And he quoted the Old Testament verse there about the, you know, not to muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain. And that really started to soften my heart. I was like, okay, so this is a biblical thing. You know, it's not like they're just wanting to give me money, you know. Um, It's a biblical concept to pay those who are working in the ministry. And what happens over time is that uh, just from a personal experience, I've also seen it happen with other people that have come on staff at this church, but uh, what you find that happens is that the time spent in the ministry starts to grow more valuable than the time you could spend in a secular job. And so if you're called to be in the ministry, you want to do that more. And so you know, through, through the tithes and giving that you guys participate in this church, you know, you, you contribute to that in paying the elders of this church so that they can focus more on the ministry. I mean, it, can you imagine if, uh, you know, Troy had, had to work a secular job because there wasn't enough tro- uh, money coming into the church, let's just say, and, and he had to work a job, and then all of his spare time was taken up by trying to prepare for Sunday's message. So then he wouldn't have time to meet with ministry leaders. He wouldn't have time to counsel with you when you're going through a trial or a marital issue. And so that's the idea where the advantage lies in paying the elders of the church. So if an elder has qualified himself... Uh, by the standards that we read in 1 Timothy 3, the qualifications of an elder, uh, how do we know if if they're doing well? Well, I I think that they should bear fruit. I mean, are you guys fed every week? Every week you come here and you, you get the message. Do you feel like you get fed every week? I know I do. Is this a healthy body? You know, are people friendly? Do you, do you feel like people uh, believe what they're taught? Do people act out what they're taught? And I think we have a really, really healthy church in that aspect. But I want to share something that, uh, that Jesus spoke of on this topic. Because this is really the game changer. And it's found in John 10, 11 through 13. John 10, 11 through 13. I'll go ahead and read that for us. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Okay, so Jesus, being the good shepherd, gives us the model of what an elder should follow. You see, we, we don't want to be a hired hand. We don't want to be like, like that that Jesus is talking about. We want to have his heart. We want to care for the sheep as though we own the sheep. So 
you know, even though Jesus is the good shepherd and we are just under shepherds, we don't want to be the hired hand. And I bring this up also because, you know, just getting paid doesn't make somebody a shepherd. I think you would agree with that. It's more about the heart and the care for the people in the congregation. Because in, you know, when the trials and the tribulations come, someone who's not a true shepherd is going to flee. You know, when the, the heat gets turned up, when times get tough, they're going to look out for a number one and not the flock. And so, you know, you guys, this is one part where you come in, you know, you guys can pray for the elders of this church, you know, that, that we uh, give to uh, the flock, you know, that we care for the flock as, as though we own it and that we're not out for number one. Well, different troubles can exist in the ministry. And as we move on, I think uh, Paul points out a couple of them. And we can read that in verses 19 and 20. Do not admit a charge against an elder except an ev- on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. Well, as we, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, it's important that elders hold each other accountable. You know, the elders of any church, uh, those that are in leadership, carry targets on their back. You know, we all carry targets. And so what Satan wants to do is he wants to wreak havoc Right? The Bible says that Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And so Satan wants to attack the leadership. And because of that, any accusation that's brought uh, before the church for an elder, it has to hold water. And I th- this is really important because if, if we just entertain any false accusation, then Satan's going to have a field day with that. He could uh, really uh, defame somebody on a false accusation. So this is really important. It's really important to hold the leadership of the church together. Now, I don't want you to think that, you know, elders are above any sort of standard here. If anything, it's just the opposite. Uh, He actually holds us to a stronger standard. Sorry, I lost the word. Uh, if you see there in, in verse 20, when he says that those who persist in sin, so that this would be a, an elder that is unrepentant. Well, bring them up before the church. And so, you know, it's not like, he, he's not trying to protect elders. He's trying to protect The church body, actually. Now, this really isn't a new teaching, though. Jesus taught the same thing, and I want to share that with you guys. Um, It can be found in Matthew 18, 15 through 17, and I'll go ahead and read that. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So like I, like I mentioned, it, it's... It's uh, the same standard for elders, if not even a notch higher. And um, James says the same thing uh, in James 3.1. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. That verse is... uh, really scared me at times, you know. It's like, well, I don't want to teach then. Uh, 
but you know that that's not that's not the heart of it. Obviously, you know it's um, it it's actually motivation to live a, a holy life, a righteous life. You know, not that we are any better than anybody else in this church, uh, but going back to the fact that we have to set an example. And so we are held at a higher standard, and, and I think it's good. It's healthy for the whole church. Now, I also don't want you to think of this like it's, you know, the scarlet letter. You know, like, well, uh, Troy comes back and comes up here. And we need to have Jake come up here. Jake lied this week, and uh, so I, I want you all to know that he's a liar, you know. That's not the idea here, obviously. It's not to parade people in front of the church. Um, but but it, is the, it is a serious issue if that elder is not repentant of sin. So, you know, that would be like, well, yeah, I lied and I'm going to keep lying. You know, then, then we've got a heart issue with one of the elders and it needs to be dealt with. Um, now, did you notice in the... In the uh, Matthew verses there, he says, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So basically, if someone is not going to repent of their sin, you are to treat them as a non-believer. So you go back to square one with them. Well, obviously, they don't believe the gospel. They don't believe what they've already been taught. So treating them as a non-believer is then (laughs) you begin to evangelize to them again as though they had never heard the gospel. Now, because of the the nature of non-believers, let me back up just a quick second. Uh, At the end of that, in verse 20, he says, so that the rest may stand in fear. You know, I think we all know what fear is, but what does that mean? Why, Why should we be fearful? Isn't God a God of love? Well, I think that we can break, the, break fear up into two, two different types. Uh, fear for the non-believer and fear for the believer. So first I want to talk to you if you're a non-believer or the non-believers in this room. Um, because if you are not fearful of God... That means you're prideful in self. And I want to share a little bit of my testimony because that, that was my issue as a young guy. You know, you might even be here and say, yeah, I believe in God, you know. I come to church once in a while, it's great. Um, but I, I would have professed that I believed in God. But I was not living a righteous life by any means. I was living a sinful life and not repenting of it. So if you don't know what repent means, repent just means basically to agree with God, to turn from those behaviors and agree that you're not living to God's standard, that that you've missed the perfect mark that he set. And so for me, I was very fearful because I knew that I was in uh, risk of the judgment of hell. And I knew that I was not honoring God with the way I was living. And I was a very fearful guy. But you know what? That was a good thing. Because that fear is what drove me to repentance. And so, for you personally, uh, what I want you to consider is that the sins that you've committed... I think we'd all admit, you know, that we've lied, we've cheated, we've used God's name as a cuss word, we've committed adultery, we've committed murder in our hearts, we've hated people. So because of that, we're all in the risk of judgment. But there is good news, because even though that you've had that life of sin, just like I did. 2,000 years ago, God's son came in the flesh to this planet, lived a perfect, sinless life, 
and went to the cross to die for your sins. So all those things that you've committed, ever will commit in the future, he died for. He paid the penalty once and for all. Because God, God is a just God. And he can't turn his face away from sin. He can't ignore it. Or he would not be just. But because Jesus, his son, died on the cross, he accepted that as a sacrifice for you. And so for you, all you have to do is believe and trust in that. You know, after he died on the cross, he was buried in a tomb. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Well, what did that prove? That proved that he was God. That proved that he he was who he said he was. And so that's what you're putting your faith in. You're putting your faith that Jesus is the promised Messiah. He's God in the flesh. And so when you put your trust in that, you're believing that he is who he said he is. And then your sins are remembered no more. Your, your case, as I like to call it, is dismissed. All charges dropped. Now for the believer, or those of you that, who are going to become believers, let me explain fear a little bit from our, uh, a believer's point of view. I like to think of it as a fatherly fear or a respect for God. You know, the scripture teaches that God chastens his kids. We get spanking sometimes. And so, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a fear factor to that, right? I, I don't know. I mean, I know our society's changed a lot, but I, I still grew up in a, a, t- a time where dad would get out the belt, you know, and, and that, boy, you respected dad. So I kind of think of it a little bit like that, obviously different. But I want to share a, a verse from Hebrews 12.6 with you. It says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So repentance is ongoing repentance, really, is, is expected of the believer. And I want to reverse the roles on you just for a second here. Uh, I know most of you are parents. Um, but think about your relationship with your kids. Uh, you know, you expect them to obey. You expect them to uh, listen to you. You expect them to have a good attitude. Um, and when they don't, it's, it's very disheartening to you. And sometimes you have to use different fear factors with your kids, right? You might have to turn up the heat here a little bit or, you know, get serious over here with this one or, you know, to drive the point home. And, and why? Because you love that child. You want that child to do well. You want that child to be a good person. You want that child to be respectful, love, uh, respect their elders. Bad time for a pun. Um, and, you know, you want uh, them to do well. And, and that's, that's kind of how I picture it from God's point of view, that that's his desire for us as his kids. All right, moving on to verse 21. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. So Paul, Paul's warning Timothy here that, uh, you know, the elders should not be judgmental, that they should not prejudge people or their circumstances. You know, uh, just from my personal point of view, it's, uh, I like to, to get to know people, you know, find out where they come from, what they're about before I make any sort of prejudgment, you know. Uh, if somebody comes in this church, I don't want to assume, as an elder of the church, I don't want to assume that they're a believer just because they're coming to church. Um, or if they come in, you know, just looking like like they just got out of a party or something. You know, I don't want to prejudge their appearance either. I don't want to assume, oh, well, clearly they can't be a believer if they look like that. You know, that's obviously the wrong heart to have. 
And so really, you know, this, this is applicable for all of us, you know, that uh, we should not be prejudging people or being partial to certain people. You know, one, one thing that we've seen happen in the church is that uh, we get into cliques, right? We, we get partial to, our, to our, uh, our peeps or the people we like to hang out with. And then it's r- difficult to reach out of that group to talk to other people. Uh, you know, it's no different for us on staff at the church. You know, it's we see each other all week, so it's so easy to, we know each other well and we joke around and, and talk a lot. But, you know, it's, uh, I think it's good to step out of that and, and uh, not be partial to the people that we like to hang out with the most. You know, not to give advantages over others. Um, one, one way I could re- relate this to the ministry in the church is that, you know, it, it's easy to give partiality to maybe somebody who serves in ministry. You know, like, oh, well, they're so committed servants, you know, maybe we shouldn't ask them to do that. You know, that's a temptation that you fall into or maybe not holding them accountable to something. I'm not talking about sin necessarily, but, you know, maybe they're doing something in their ministry that uh, maybe they shouldn't do that. Maybe they're being a little harsh or rough around the edges. And so, you know, you want to approach them and kind of help them work through those issues. But there's that temptation of, giving them partiality you know gosh well I don't don't want to offend them I don't want to drive them out of the ministry or I don't want to drive them away you know but that again that that should not be the heart now for the church as a whole this is where all you guys come in all of us actually um, you know we have dozens of visitors that come to this church every week brand new people that have never been here before so this is, this is a task I want to give you guys, and I, I'm working on it more myself, but we want to make visitors feel welcome, and it takes way more than just the elders of the church to make that happen. That's where you guys all play a part. You know, someone sits next to you, you don't know them. You know, give them a warm hand and a, and a welcome. Make them feel like, you know, uh, this is our church family, this is the living room, Right? Make them feel welcome in the living room. Uh, one thing that we've started to do as a staff is that we, we make a point every week to meet somebody new within the church. Uh, we also try to meet somebody outside of the church, but I just want to keep it uh, in context to here in the church. Uh, we tried to meet somebody new. And when we started doing this, I was really convicted by this because um, I stepped out. I'm a... I'm a a real introvert and so for me to get out and talk to people it's, it's difficult I, I really have to push myself um, but we uh, I went ahead and stepped out started talking to some people met some great people but where I was convicted was that uh, I met two different families who said they had been coming here uh, around a year and I'd never talked to them and that, that was crushing to me I was like wow here I am one of the leaders in the church, and I haven't met these people, you know, and, and I felt really bad about it. And, and it kind of sparked a change in my heart that I want, I want to meet everybody now. And you guys see this every Sunday, right? When you come, Pastor Troy's out front greeting you. Uh, you know, he, he's the guy that likes to lead by example. So he's out there making you feel welcome. Uh, not only making you feel welcome, but I know he genuinely wants to get to know you and and uh, know who he's ministering to. Let's move on to verse 22. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take, make, sorry, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Okay, so Paul starts off by repeating the caution to not appoint elders quickly. We read that earlier on in Timothy. Uh, If you weren't with us, you can go back and review that if you want. But um, he said you shouldn't appoint elders too quickly. You know, they need to be around for a while. They need to be established in the faith. 
And uh, the, the tail end of that is really what I want to close with because um, he's talking about keeping yourself pure or sanctification. And it's kind of funny because, you know, when you read 23, doesn't it kind of seem like it's out of context? You know, he's talking about elders, and, and now all of a sudden he's talking about, Timothy, you should drink some wine. Well, I, I think a good way to explain this is that it's, it's a parenthesis. So it's funny that I chose to use the ESV version because it actually has parentheses around that, that scripture. And, and I think what, this is how I imagine how he's trying to communicate with, Tim and, with Timothy. You know, Timothy, you're doing a great job at being an example to the church, being an example of not drinking, you know, not leading people astray. But we both know that you have a stomach issue. So why don't you take a little bit of wine, you know, and help with that? And I think that's why that's, why that's in there, because it's right on the tail of keep yourself pure. And so I think he's, he's actually kind of trying to caution Timothy a little bit not to be legalistic. Now, one of the qualifications of the elders wasn't that the elders couldn't drink, but that they wouldn't be given to wine. And, and there's obviously, by the context of what uh, Paul is telling Timothy, was that he probably took that a little too far. He wasn't drinking it at all, which is fine, except for, you know, uh, the bacteria in the water was really probably wreaking havoc with his stomach, and the wine could help him with that. So that's just a good reminder for us, you know, that uh, purity isn't necessarily what is on the outside, right? Now, you know, we can be practical about the things, just like he's uh, teaching Timothy there, you know, use it as medicine, you know, this isn't a green light to go <laughs> start drinking it up. It's just, you know, this is a practical thing you can do, and it's medicinal. So sanctification, let's close with this. Um, if you don't know what sanctification means, it basically means to be set apart. You know, we just got done celebrating Thanksgiving, right? And uh, I don't think this happens too much anymore either, but... Uh, some of the older folks in the room would probably appreciate this a little bit more. But, you know, on Thanksgiving or a special occasion, what does mama do, right? She goes to the special hutch and pulls out the special uh, plates or the china, the fine china and the real silver silverware, right? And so that's kind of just a lame example of how I want to express what being set apart is. Because, see, it's the same for God. When you become a Christian, when you're saved, God is sanctifying you for a special purpose that he wants to use you for. Now, he might be saving you for that for later, or it might be for a time such as now. Maybe today is your Thanksgiving that God's going to use you. Maybe tomorrow. So God does the sanctification but how can we sanctify ourselves, similar to the command given to Timothy? Keep yourself pure. How can we sanctify ourselves? Who, me? <laughs> Sorry. I was checking the time and Siri went off. Great. <laughs> That's embarrassing. At least I wasn't updating Facebook, right? Uh... You know, to me, it's we have to make spiritual choices that benefit the spirit instead of the flesh. That's plain and simple it. Consider these verses that are in Thessalonians. It's 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who, who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things 
as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. So if you're a believer and you're struggling with sin, you got to stop. you got to repent. Because you can't live a separated life if you're chained to sin. You know, this going through this for me, uh, there were so many things personally in my life that it was applicable to. But any time I repent of the sins that I'm caught up in, whether they're known or not, any time I just come to the Lord with a repentant heart, he, he gives me such a joy. And this is one of the things that an exercise that I was able to do was just to evaluate my walk and look at ways where I'm risking myself of purity or where I'm, you know, not, not living a pure life, where I'm sinning. And then to turn from that and get back on the right track with God. And I think the, these are the exact same, uh, the exact same theme that he's talking about in Timothy 24 and 25, the last two verses. Um, uh, the, the thought continues. He goes on to say, the sins of some people are conspicuous going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also, good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. So rather your sins are, sec- are in secret or other people know about them, they're all going to be revealed one day. So you, you, have, you have the choice now. Um, on the day of judgment, everything's going to come to light. It's all going to be revealed. You know, so why not repent of it now? And then be free of that, that chain that's holding you down. Be free so that you can let your, your light shine before men, as the scripture says. I'll share one more verse with you. It's, it's Luke 12, 2, uh, on the same train of thought. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. So if you're, if you're struggling with anything, personal sin, I just encourage you to repent of that today. You know, It's between you and God, but if, if it's of a matter where you need to go to somebody and ask for forgiveness or, um, or confess your sins to that person, uh, you should do that today. Um, also, the elders will be up front here to pray with you. You know, if you want... Uh, to confess to an elder, I don't know. Uh, I know that sounds funny, but, um, you know, just know that that's an option. And we'll pray with you. You don't even have to say what it is. You know, we, we'll, we'll pray for you, help you to get back on track, and so that you can live a pure life, as he said. All right, will you guys stand and pray with me? Well, Father, uh, we thank you so much, God, uh, just for this scripture that we've been able to share together today, Lord. And um, just thank you, Lord, for the teaching of uh, the elders and their role in the church, but also the application for us all, Lord. You know, Lord, we're we're all in full-time ministry. It might not be in the church, Lord, but you gave each and every believer the great commission when you left this earth and it was to go make disciples of the nations. And so we all play a part in that Lord. And we know that the snares of sin can hold us back Lord. And so we, we trust in your forgiveness Lord. We repent of our sins and we want to turn that over to you Lord so that we can be cleansed. I'm so thankful for the verse that says if we are faithful and just to confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins. And so we thank you, Lord, that your heart is forgiveness. Lord, that you don't want to punish your kids, but that you just want a repentant heart. 